What we would like to do today is try to help you in your classes manage the international students' learning in a way that will help them increase their language, understand what's happening in class, but not require from you very much more than you're already doing. I think we can show you a few methods and techniques. So our department is doing three sessions today. We're basing each session on a different uh, theory of language acquisition and language learning and teaching. So this first session is on comprehensible input. This theory says that students must understand most of what you're saying in order to process it and function with that language. It must be at their level of comprehension. And in instruction, they function very well at comprehension plus one. Of course, they're learning new material. That's why they're in your class. They need new material. So if they understand 98% of the words in the text and you're teaching them the new words that function in your topic and in your field, then you get this plus one kind of concept. So we're going to try to show you some ways to find out what their comprehension level is and what you might do to help them in the transition to that plus one. So one of the things that is helpful is we have computers to count. And people have counted the frequency of common words. We work on this a lot with the international students so that they know the common words. And then there are some high frequency academic words. If you look on your handout, there are some examples on there that will talk about both of them. Right at the top of this page, this one says principles, the top of the other page, give you some examples. The students really need to know 9,000 words in English to function in an academic class at all. Um, domestic students could know 18 to 20,000, but international students need 9,000. We, our goal is to get them to 5,500 or so when they leave EIL. Therefore, when they come into your GE 100 classes, there's a gap in their comprehension because they're going to need closer to 900, 9,000. So here's some examples on this handout of general frequency words they would know and some highly frequent academic words. We have something we use called the academic word list which we teach to our students. If you're really interested, I, on the handout, I, I'll show you where to find it online, or I have a paper copy of these common words across all disciplines. But how do you know if it's comprehensible? Okay, this is a heads up. We might do another workshop if you are interested. If you would prepare electronic text, I could tell you if it's comprehensible at which thousand level. So here's some text I use in my vocabulary class where I'm teaching them academic vocabulary. This is unit five. And I've put it in a frequency counter. Um, oh, got to go to the next slide. <laughs> um, to show how, whether this is frequent or not. So these are three readings from unit five. They cover the topics of cultural geography, microbiology, they're related to food topics. So the research shows that students need to know 95 to 98 percent of the running words in order to really comprehend it. They start out saying 90 and they start doing more tests and guess what? You want a 75 percent score on a comprehension test, they need very close to 98 percent. So to read these articles without assistance, how many words do they need to know? Well, 9744 is at 9,000. These are all readings out of GE level texts across campus. They're from other textbooks. So this shows you the amount of uh, material that's needed in order to understand that. All right, so I'm going to flip over to the page I got this information from and show you what it looks like. So here's the output. I've taken my electronic text, and if you're interested, ask us, we'll come back and show you how to do it. And I put it in there. So this is the same thing I had on the screen capture. So you can see that they need 9,000 words to understand it. 
Okay, they don't. They're in my class. That's why they're in my class. They don't know 9,000 words. They're closer to 5,000. Which words do I need to teach? So this shows me my text in the white, and then it colors the code. If you learn the code, you know that blue is 1,000, green is 2,000, ye yellow is 3,000. Okay. But I can go down here and see the words. Okay, there's all those really common blue words. Everybody knows those. Mostly they know the green words. We're teaching them the yellow words. What you want to do is start looking for words that are below or higher than that 5,000 they might know or 6,000 that are really important for your text. So I see some oregano. It's only used once. No, so there's a number after it. There's only, it's only used once. Antibacterial, hmm, used twice. There's a microbiology text in there, and so that might be the term I'm teaching in class. It's very important that they understand that term. Doesn't matter that it's far down the list into something, you know, 12,000 or more. Hieroglyphics mentioned once. I'm going to skip it. I'm going to leave it out. If you have an electronic text, it will take you two to three minutes to drop it in this tool. It's on your paper as lextutor.ca. And get an idea of which words are going to give trouble in the text. And then you could just bring them up as part of your discourse in class or point them out to them. All right. So this is a way to find out if your text is really difficult and maybe which words you need specific attention to. <clears throat> so what can you do to help? Well, you can point it out. I think Brother Wolfsberger will talk this afternoon about some um, ways to help them notice. It's another theory of language learning. Help them notice it, then they can learn it. Point it out to them. I want to talk today about some other things that give them difficulty besides just one vocabulary word. I find that in academics we make a lot of two and three word phrases that have an academic meaning. And the students might know actually all of the words in the phrase, but they don't know the meaning of the phrase. Watch for these in your disciplines and see. So these are some things I'm going to show you. Let's start with. Um, some sp words that have specific meanings. This happened to me yesterday in class, so I put it up there. I teach social ling linguistics, and yesterday we're talking about the word register. Well, I don't mean cash register in social linguistics. So there are words we use across. We might have some accounting people would have a different meaning for register. So. Um, I might need to point out or confirm the meaning related to my topic. Let me go over to the dictionary here and show you. Um, here's dictionary.com, and here's the, me I hope that's big enough to see. So here's some definitions for register, and my definition is not there. All right, so the most common, most dictionaries try to put them in the most common order. So this is the noun definition of register, and I'm just not there. So I have to see, oh, there's the music register. There's the photography register. There's the printing register. And then down at number 13 is my linguistics definition. So you might use these words so often, you will forget that they're used in another context. You might point out to them, here's the meaning we're using for this class. Some other ones that came up in my EIL class with the international students were doing a chapter on marketing, taking text from a marketing textbook. So look at those words up there and see the different meanings that could, they could have by your discipline. Take a minute and talk to the people at your table and think of, look at those words or think of some words that are moderately common in the language but might have a specialized meaning in what you teach. 
So share with the people at your table. Now let me show you another example. One of the things that's really hard, you brought up slang that's very difficult to understand. Another thing that's difficult to understand is what we call phrasal verbs. We think they're easy, and they're not easy. So I'm going to play an example. This is Elder Robbins giving his uh, talk at General Conference last October. I'm going to play about three minutes and see if you can count how many times he used the word face. The name of his talk is, Which Way Do You Face? And see how many times he uses face in the first three minutes. Which way do you face? President Boyd K. Packer surprised me with this puzzling question while we were traveling together on my very first assignment as a new 70. Without an explanation to put the question in context, I was baffled. A 70, he continued, does not represent the people to the prophet, but the prophet to the people. Never forget which way you face. It was a powerful lesson. Trying to please others before pleasing God is inverting the first and second great commandments. It is forgetting which way we face. And yet, we have all made that mistake because of the fear of men. In Isaiah, the Lord warns us, Fear ye not the reproach of men. In Lehi's dream, this fear was triggered by the finger of scorn, pointed from the great and spacious building, causing many to forget which way they faced and to leave the tree ashamed. This peer pressure tries to change a person's attitudes, if not behavior, by making one feel guilty for giving offense. We seek respectful coexistence with those who point fingers, but when the fear of men tempts us to condone sin, it becomes a snare, according to the book of Proverbs. The snare may be cleverly baited to appeal to our compassionate side, to tolerate or even approve of something that has been condemned by God. For the weak of faith, it can be a major stumbling block. For example, some young missionaries carry this fear of men into the mission field and fail to report the flagrant disobedience of a companion to their mission president because they don't want to offend their wayward companion. Decisions of character are made by remembering the right order of the first and second great commandments. When these confused missionaries realize they are accountable to God and not to their companion, it should give them courage to do an about-face. At the youthful age of 22, even Joseph Smith forgot which way he faced when he repeatedly importuned the Lord to allow Martin Harris to borrow the 116 manuscript pages. Perhaps Joseph wanted to show gratitude to Martin for his support. We know that Joseph was extremely anxious for other eyewitnesses to stand with him against the distressing falsehoods and lies being spread about him. Whatever Joseph's reasons were, or as justified as they may appear, the Lord did not excuse them and sharply rebuked him. How oft you have transgressed and have gone on in the persuasions of men. For behold, you should not have feared man more than God. This poignant experience helped Joseph remember forever after which way he faced. When one tries to save face with men, they can unwittingly lose face with God. Thinking one can please God and at the same time condone the disobedience of men isn't neutrality, but duplicity, or being two-faced or trying to serve two masters. While it certainly takes courage to face perils, the true badge of courage is overcoming the fear of men. For example, Daniel's prayers helped him face lions, but what made him lion-hearted was defying King Darius. So did you count? How many? It's a little hard to hear. Yeah, there's quite a, in the whole talk, there's 19. How many meanings of face? We think that's an easy word. So the students all know the word face, and he didn't mean this one time, right? It's not his face, this face he was talking about. What, what did you hear for the meanings? Stand up to something. Yes, have courage and, you know, look at your problems and take care of them. Yes, that's one of the meanings. About face. You know, I play this in class, so I have no idea what about face means. What you should focus on. What you should focus on. 
where you should keep your, the glance of your eye and the mind, mind's eye. Now, he used, in his talk, he used seven meanings of face. And he probably thinks, well, it's, it's a clever meaning in English, and it's a very clever way to use it, but it's very difficult to translate. I'm sure the translators had a lot of trouble. Let me go to a dictionary and show you how bad it is. So, this is a learner dictionary. Whew. They know how difficult it is. So these are idioms, slang, some of them are, you know, so he talked about saving face, about face, to face, lose face. They, you know, they're not going to know a lot of them. It's very easy to use these. We think they're easy words, but if I even click on that first definition of face, then it, this dictionary shows the student how hard it is. Ooh. That's just the, the noun meanings. Oh, we're clear up to, oh, okay. It's a very difficult word. We have lots of words we use in English. They're very common. They are the blue words. They are in the first thousand most frequent words in English. And we join them with a preposition. And they have literally thousands of meanings. One of the linguistics professors in, in Provo came up with a list of 12 very frequent verbs times the prepositions have 40,000 meanings. We say them all the time. If you can learn to drop them out and use an academic school-based word, they're more likely to know the school-based word. We say something and they, you know, you need to acquire this form in the language and they're looking at me, but get, you know, it's really terrible. Get's the worst one. All right. Let me show you a few and then you can uh, practice some and talk about which ones you might use. And Okay, let's try this one. So here's the word go. So you can go about, go about with, go after, go against. You see this long list. And I only got to the B. So these are so difficult that good companies have made dictionaries with these phrasal verbs in them. Because with go, there's 17 pages of entries for go. No, oh, they're terrible words. They're so hard. Here's one I like to bring up in class because it always makes them laugh. But look at these sample sentences using makeup. So it's not just that there's all those combinations with the prepositions, but once you make a combination, there's multiple meanings. I didn't put them all on. There's more meanings than I put on the slide that didn't fit. But that's just makeup. So these actually are difficult. If it's important in your discipline, you can confirm the meaning you want with that, that term. If it's not important and you have an academic school type word, a Latin based word, they actually will understand that better and remember it better. So. Try a few. Talk to each other at the table. Come up with, pick, up, pick one of those verbs, try out some prepositions and see how many meanings. To get this in your mind, how difficult this might be for an international student to read this dictionary. Okay. All right, I see some grins on your face. Once you know this, you'll realize it. And here's what I observe happen. You say your academic word, and you notice that the students didn't quite understand and you simplify to this. What would be better is if you see it happen is stop, repeat the academic word and confirm the meaning if they still look confused. They're gonna get the academic word better than they're gonna get this idiomatic language that carries so many meanings. Mostly if I do makeup in class as an example with the international students, they get two meanings. They all, they all know about makeup tests and makeup class and the girls all know about makeup. They don't, most of them don't know about making up a false story. All right, here's another one that gave me trouble when I was teaching. This is a story that happened to me. I was teaching legal English in Beijing, and I'm not a lawyer, I'm an English teacher, so I'm busy learning law. And when I, I have a textbook that um, someone had written who had also taught legal English to international students. So I'm fine when it comes in Latin, I know I'm going to laws the Black's Law Dictionary and look it up. But, you know, here came this term, 
I don't have any process. Service of process, right? Okay, no problem. I don't look it up, and I'm just going, and then I get to the assignment the students are supposed to do. That's what's written up there. Huh? <laughs> I, know, I know what service is. I know what process is. Obviously, there's a legal definition to service of process. It's a concept in law that's important enough that probably Brother Bybee's relative? <laughs> this must be Ariel Bybee suing the Bonn Opera Company because they broke the contract for her to sing at that opera house. Uh, these types of terms can give students a lot of trouble where they know service, they know process, but service of process, they have no idea. So this is where you put multiple phrases. We love to do this in academics. We like to define something with a set of words. Let me show you another example that came up in social linguistics a couple of weeks ago. We're talking about how language changes over time, and so they're talking about doing apparent time hypotheses. My international students tell me they know that word apparent. When I try to tell them what apparent time hypotheses is, there's the definition from the textbook. Oh, well, no, they could not give back to me in any kind of language what apparent time hypotheses was. Maybe you can't even. So apparent is one of the academic words we study. They should know it when they come to your class, but they can't understand apparent time. It's a research methodology, so I've got to explain the research concept of testing a young person and an old person at the same time, and adult people's language don't change over time, so we can assume that the language has changed if the grandmothers speak differently than the teenage girls. In real time, you watch them over the years. Okay, once I get real time in there, it makes more sense. But you could take a few minutes when you think. Here's one that's in my in a, uh, vocabulary class textbook, highly specialized production regions. It's an article about the culture geography of food. This is one of the main concepts because it's one of the four categories of types of food by region. They know every single one of those words and they have no idea what highly specialized production region is. This is what we do in academics. We take a bunch of nouns, put them in front of another noun, they turn into head adjectives and confuse everyone. <laughs> but we like them, they're in every subject, Watch for them because you might point out where in the textbook it defines the phrase. Instead of sending them to the dictionary to look up each word and trying to add it together, because it doesn't usually match the context you're talking about because we create these terms. So there's a couple of others. I've never yet taught an EIL student who knew what comparative advantage was when they read it. They know compare, they know advantage, and they don't understand the economic concept of comparative advantage. There's a lot of meaning packed into that term. Okay, talk at your table. See if you can come up with a term that's important in your discipline that you use and talk about, but might have moderately straightforward vocabulary. I put a couple more examples up there. One of the things you can do is just point out the term, bracket the term for them, say this has a meaning in this class, these three words together, or these two words together. You need to know the meaning of these two words. I can do it in the abstract, but if you can do it in the class when you want your content to be understood, it doesn't take very long. I do this a lot. Look at those words, right? That's a term. You've got to understand those together. And then you can go on, and it just helps them know there's a specialized meaning and they've got to find it out if they didn't get it from what happened in class or the reading of the textbook. All right, one last thing, and then we'll switch over and uh, Leola will talk about some other ideas. Navigate your discussion or lecture in class. We, we did a, a senior did a research project and they took two different sections and in one section the teacher said, now moving on to say that again, now let's go back to point number two because it's going to apply right here in point number four. The verbal direction of where you're going is very helpful in making them comprehend what's happening and what's coming next. Somebody used the example, don't say, and so, 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 so what? You know, where, where is so going? You can just give them, to rephrase it, now I need to go to the next point. Oh, I skipped this one, I'm gonna go back over here. And you just clearly mark 
where the language is going, where the idea is going.